Greetings, friends of liberty. And as you can see, I'm in the TARDIS, again, I'm on a specific mission to deliver a needle to the natives. The Neanderthal natives, that is, in 65,000 BC. Did you know that Neanderthals haven't even invented the sewing needle? Truly a dreadful state of affairs. No ability, really, to utilize what you call layered clothing. Time shall tell with what success I'll have in their instruction. But to another, more topical issue. And as I travel amongst you in 21st century America, I've noted that among the concepts most frequently used by the politically correct is that of diversity, which seems used to justify an extraordinarily wide range of behaviors and policies in modern liberal institutions. In this video, coming from my background in the more enlightened 18th century, I shall analyze three of its main aspects what diversity actually is, whether, as liberals say, it is good, and whether liberals are consistent in their use and application of the term. Number one, what is diversity? To say that things are diverse is just to say that they are different. Nothing more, nothing less. From that basic insight, flows our whole analysis. So, for example, if we have a group of two good people and suddenly we replace one of the good persons with a bad person, we now have a more diverse group ethically. Or if we've been feverishly studying for final exams and thus preparing macaroni and cheese on our hot plate and eating it meal after meal in our dorm room for the last two weeks, once we've taken our exams, we naturally desire something different. And so we may head out to the nearest Thai, Italian, or French restaurant. Number two, is diversity good? So as the previous examples imply, in order for diversity to be good, it has to satisfy two criteria. First, it has to be relevant to our well-being and positive. So for example, Let's imagine a college that doesn't have many Irish students and that wants to admit many, many more Irish, even if they're not qualified. Since the problem for the college is that it doesn't want to admit that it's biased, it looks for some irrelevant characteristic that it can claim is good. Well, how about hair color? Yes, the college administrators could point out that 10% or more of the Irish are red-headed claim that being redheaded is good, and then use that irrelevant criteria as a pretext for admission. Second, even if the characteristic were relevant and positive, it is still never sufficient by itself. In other words, other characteristics and criterion have to be satisfied as well. So, in the original example I gave of a student studying for finals for two weeks in his apartment and just eating macaroni and cheese, if, having finished his exams, he now goes out to a Thai restaurant, he still has to have food which is not contaminated, well cooked, properly seasoned, and not cold when served. In other words, it's not enough for the food just to be different. Similarly, even if we were to accept hypothetically that African Americans have a potentially relevant subcultural or experiential difference, that potential relevant difference would not excuse not meeting all the other criteria, like a good SAT score and GPA, that would be necessary for admission. A final argument that has sometimes been presented is that evolution uses diversity via mutations to create different potential species. Wouldn't this prove diversity is good? But again, no, because species still have to prove that their specific mutational difference, like giraffes having a slightly longer neck and not a shorter neck, is good. In other words, some mutations are good and some aren't, even though they're all different. In summary, diversity in itself is never good, 
but only good if it gives some actual additional value, such as with food diversity in giving us more pleasure or with human diversity in giving us more potential knowledge. Number three, and finally, are liberals consistent in their use of the term? And the answer is no, they're not. And that's because of what I would call positive racism. For example, let's imagine a judge with a black criminal standing in front of him, a criminal who deserves 10 years in jail for aggravated assault. A judge expressing negative racism would give that criminal 20 years in prison, whereas a judge expressing positive racism would give him no years. Academia is filled with positive racists. And so how do they betray their positive racism? In the following inconsistent ways. Firstly, if colleges wanted to teach an understanding of an empathy with other cultures or subcultures, they would recognize that colleges have actually already done this for at least three quarters of a century. To paraphrase from Peter Woods' superb book, Diversity, the Invention of a Concept. Previously, in the 1950s, diversity referred to students from the West Coast, from Texas, and from Alaska, Florida, and Connecticut, from kids in urban or rural settings, to musicians and poets and budding sculptors, to your typical jocks, to Latin and Greek nerds, or those with a sci-fi or physics obsession, potential lawyers, social butterflies, or future professors. So actually, you Americans have been naturally and spontaneously doing diversity background of lived experience and of differing values and interests for a long time without sacrificing standards, except occasionally for those legacies or really good quarterbacks. Secondly, Asian Americans have a subculture just as different as African Americans, but routinely, on average, make better students. But do the liberal racists in academia care about cultural diversity and the Asian lived experience as a method for creating a tolerant and enlightened student body? Nope, not in the slightest. To the contrary, with their positive racism for blacks, Harvard being a typical example, they refuse to let in many qualified Asian Americans. And this despite the fact that Asian Americans have successfully overcome anti-Asian hate. Remember how some of you Americans of centuries past used to talk about the yellow peril, which hostile attitudes Asian Americans overcame? But do those racists at Harvard actually have any desire to showcase this Asian American triumph of hard work and perseverance over racism? No, no desire. Thirdly, if colleges wanted to teach an effective understanding of other cultures, beyond your borders, they would teach the languages of those cultures so you could understand them. But do they require more foreign languages? No. The study of French, Italian, German, and the languages of the classics are more and more neglected. Fourthly, if they wanted to teach empathy, inclusion, and understanding, they would teach the study of great literature. Can one learn empathy in any better way, for example, than by reading Hugo's Les Mis or watching the musical? But do the liberal racists in academia, in order to cultivate more empathy of and intolerance of others, tolerance of others require more courses in great works or literature or art? No. Fifthly and finally, if colleges actually cared about the virtues that supposedly come from an encounter with the diverse, they would promote viewpoint diversity. But this is, again, exactly what they don't do, instead allowing increasing acts and expressions of intolerance against conservatives, libertarians, Christians, or others on campus. And isn't the creation of safe spaces and trigger warnings and the pandering to social justice mobs the exact opposite? of encouraging viewpoint diversity. And thus, we've arrived at the end of our succinct analysis. And having covered the topic in depth, 
I shall practice subject diversity over a different topic next time. In the meantime, I bid you well and remain as ever the Scarlet Pimpernel.